If you, uh, if you have your Bible, grab your copy of Scripture and turn to John chapter 18. John 18. We read the passage that I'm going to focus on, and, and um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to reread the text. I, I read it in the Scripture reading, so it's fresh. The whole narrative is fresh. It's been in front of you in, in the scope of your view. And as we work through this, I'm just going to make some, some pretty quick flyby comments. And so, um, if ever there was a time for running commentary, I think this is it. But there are some incredible, incredible implications from this story uh, that we benefit from. Mankind is um, plagued by a legacy of living lie after lie after lie. Generation after generation of mankind continues to pursue lies, sin, and deception while we attempt to justify ourselves. And that's the lot in life for every man, and and certainly that's even more acute to the degree that we're exposed to religious truth. Simple fact is, man's been created to worship God. We were created in God's image to worship him. So it's hardwired into our conscience. Every human being is a worshiper by nature. But of course, we're fallen, and we're sinful, and having been created to worship God, we've sought out various devices. We have fallen short of the glory of God in the sense that men sought to worship and they started worshiping created things. That's what it means to fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of worshiping divine glory and we worship created glory. Animals, forms, images, most commonly self. And this worship of creation is the biggest lie. And man's been doing that for 6,000 years. And if, it, if, it was, if, if time and effort were of any indicator, we should have reached perfection by now. We should have perfected the art. But guess what? No mankind, no generation has ever pulled it off. It is impossible to live a lie and indict the God who created us to live for his glory. No sinner created in God's image who lives in his universe and breathes his air has ever successfully pulled off the the, the gamble of thinking, I can actually live for selfish glory and get away with it. And what we do, though, is we have to indict truth itself. And this story that we read, this is the most, this is the greatest portrayal of the human attempt to accomplish the impossible putting truth on trial. So I titled this devotional here, Truth on Trial. Let's dive into verse 28. Jesus has already been tried in the religious courts. Um, If you put all the synoptics together with the Gospel of John, you would read that there are six trials, uh, Annas, Caiaphas, and then finally the Sanhedrin, then Pilate, then then Herod, then back to Pilate. So you have six. You have three religious, three civil. Three at the hands of the Jews, three at the hands of the Gentiles. And so the Jews have already tried, quote-unquote, Jesus Christ. Every one of those three, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, have all deemed Jesus to be worthy of death. Their verdict? He's guilty because he claimed to be the Son of Man and the Son of God. Well, newsflash, the verdict was true. He did claim those things. And newsflash, those things are true. He was indicted for speaking the truth about his own identity. The only thing Jesus has ever been guilty of is the truth. And so, they turn him over to the Gentiles. They led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium. The praetorium is wherever Pilate happens to be. The praetorium typically is in Caesarea Philippi, which is on the coast. But now at a high holy feast, Pilate being the procurator of Galilee, or of Judea better, he would actually leave uh, Caesarea Philippi and then come to uh, Jerusalem and stay there. So now the praetorium is his headquarters, wherever he happens to be. Um, we don't know. Archaeologists would debate whether that's over by the West Wall, over by the Fortress Antonia. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. They bring Jesus over here to the Praetorium, and it was early. That's, a, that's a early in the morning. It's probably about 6 a.m. Putting that together with what the term means, it's a fourth watch for the Roman army, which would be 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. You mix it with the synoptics, it looks like this is right about 6 a.m. 
28b, they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now, this is a fascinating comment. Um, These Jews are so scrupulous that they want to observe the man-made arbitrary laws put in place so that they can observe the Passover feast. Now, if you're an, uh, an, an aware reader, you might remember that on the previous night, which would have been Thursday night, Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples. And so there's a lot of debate about what the Passover is here. There's really only two legitimate options, and they're both legitimate. But the term Passover can be used to refer to the Passover plus the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Chagiga would have been the first meal on the first day of the Unleavened Bread. And that would apply. That could, that could make perfect sense here. Or it's also true that historically, in order to facilitate the amount of sacrifices necessary for the entire Jewish people to sacrifice animals in the temple, the northern tribes would tend to sacrifice their Passover feast on the Thursday, and the, the southern tribes would pass, sacrifice on the, on the Friday. And it looks like John's pointing out that while the Galileans ate Passover the night before, Jesus is actually in the process of being tried and crucified while they are observing the Passover in the south. What's ironic about this is the scruples to observe all of these man-made rules. There's no law in the Old Testament that you're unclean for entering the house of a Gentile. There was rules about entering the house of, uh, uh, of, a, of a Syrian or a Gentile, um, and you're unclean. The Mishnah describes that. The Talmud describes that. One rumor is that because Gentiles were known to have practiced abortion, uh, the, the, the death and the body, having been in the house where that would have been performed, would make you unclean under the Levitical law for seven days. And so, of course, if you were unclean for seven days, or let alone 24 hours, if it was a 24-hour uncleanness, you wouldn't be able to eat the, the meal that very day on the Friday. So, ironically, in order to eat the Passover but committed to killing the Passover lamb himself, they're scrupulously maintaining man-made laws while perpetrating evil and perversity of the worst kind in history. How ironic. Here's the lamb of God sent to purge, cleanse the sins of the world. John the Baptist said so in John 1, 29. And here he is in front of them, and they're so godly, and they're so reverent, and they're so worshipful that they make sure they don't go into the praetorium so they can observe the Passover. Pilate therefore went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate was a man who lacked the courage of his convictions, unlike the Jews he ruled. There's even stories of the Jews protesting against him, willing to lay down their life so that he would change customs, and and he did. And here's another instance where he knew better and he acted according to uh, what was most expedient and pragmatic for his politics. He asked this question, what accusation do you bring against this man? That's a fair question, but listen to the answer, how revealing. They answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So, What's the charge? What did he do wrong? We delivered him to you. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Here's the, here's the logic, just in case you missed it. Why is he guilty? Because we arrested him. Why did you arrest him? Because he's guilty. Got it. Verse 31. So Pilate said to him, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death. And so that's actually true. Ever since A.D. 6, Jews lacked authority to carry out a capital sentence. They had no ability to to actually uh, execute someone, uh, with the notable exception, of course. Rome uh, tried to allow freedom of religion uh, so long as it maintained Pax Romana. So in this case, in the region of Galilee, they still allowed them the right to kill a Gentile who would have gone across the, the dividing wall in the temple. But apart from that exception, they had no ability to carry out a capital sentence. And so what they say there is true. But notice John astutely giving a theological purpose to that comment. Verse 32, he said, this is said to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. 
Okay, don't miss it. Here we are in this study of the truth on trial, and Jesus says a word, literally a comment, a word. And of course it's going to come true, because he said it. Jesus said it, so of course it's going to come true. But notice that it has to happen through a complex of circumstances that are all orchestrated by God. If Caponius had not become a prefect of Galilee in AD 6, if Rome hadn't taken over, if God hadn't got a prefect in place by the time that Jesus is in his earthly ministry, who is going to be so expedient he would do whatever the people said, and you might be hearing that, that condition, you think, uh, that's about any politician, right? Well, still, figure it out. I mean, there's so many contingencies at play here to bring about this death. The Jews cannot kill him the way prophesied, and you better believe they tried. John 8, John 10, John 11 refers to the disciples commenting about Jesus not being stoned. I mean, it is three times in this gospel so far, he was not stoned. They could not stone him. Because he already said what kind of death he would be, he would die. Crucifixion on a, on a piece of wood, accursed under the curse of Deuteronomy. Cursed by God for sins he never committed. That's the kind of death he was going to die. And it involved a complex political situation like we had described here in verses 31 and 32. So that John can make the point that was simply to signify by what kind of death he was about to die. Verse 33, Pilate enters again into the praetorium and he summoned Jesus and says to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Now, Jesus is quite, he's quite used to answering a question with a question. And usually it exposes uh, the ridiculousness of the question. This is actually kind of a rare occurrence because Jesus is just pressing him, not because he's, he asked the wrong question or because he's trying, Pilate's trying to catch him. He's actually pushing for greater clarity because the nature of the question he's asking would actually earn two different responses. So notice what he says in verse 34. Jesus takes that question and says, okay, let me just, let me ask you this. Are you saying this on your own initiative? Which means, is that coming from your own concerns as a secular uh, civil leader? Or is that a question that's been handed down to you coming from religious leaders with theological concerns? Why does that matter? Because here's the difference. If it's the former, if Pilate were saying this on his own, that would mean he's asking him, are you a threat to Caesar? But if the question is actually coming from the religious leaders, then the question is, are you the Messiah, the King of Israel? And of course, the answer to the first A threat to Caesar is no. The answer to the second is, of course, yes. And so he asks for clarification. Pilate's put off. I'm not a Jew, am I? Just a question that definitely expects a very strong negative answer. I mean, it's just, am I a Jew? Are you kidding me? It's just dripping with disdain. Your your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting and I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, and maybe even more literally right there, but now, my kingdom's not of this realm. Right now, my kingdom's not of this realm. He's actually securing a kingdom, not by conquering, but by dying. He's gaining a kingdom by accepting the indictment even though he is innocent. You remember, Peter drew a sword in the, in the garden. He drew a sword to take off Malchus's ear. He obviously, to take, to cut off his head, but he took off his ear. And Jesus healed it. Uh, this is not a kingdom that can be gained by physical power, by weapons, by warfare, by physical might, by man's ability. This is a spiritual kingdom, a supernatural kingdom. It's a kingdom that does not originate from earth. It's originate, it originates in heaven and it takes over and consumes earth. Of course, Pilate misses it. It's lost on him. And so he says, so you are a king. And Jesus said, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this reason I've been born and for this reason I've come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. 
And what I love about verse 30, there's so much to love about verse 37, but what's, one thing that's fascinating about this, this is the only time that Jesus refers to his own birth. For this reason I was born. He is much more fond of referring to his, his birth as being sent into the world or coming into the world. And so he goes and, and um, even says that there in the second phrase, and for this I have come into the world. That's the typical term. But here he says, for this reason, that's the whole purpose of my birth. And that's the whole reason why I entered the world. I, came, I, entered, I decided to enter the world for this purpose, to speak truth. This is an alarming statement of pre-existence before his birth. He alludes to his intentionality before his human birth. And then when he closes that statement with everyone who is of the truth, here's my voice, could that not be more clear than in the next verse where, Peter, or where Pilate lands? Pilate says to him, what is truth? That's about the most postmodern response you could have had to Christ. What is truth? Can anybody know truth? Is there such a thing as truth? Is that even knowable? Anything definitive? Oh, you're one of those black and white types, huh? Antithesis? Oh, okay, gotcha. One of the, we got one of these guys. You know what's funny, though? It, it's true that what, Peter, what, what Pilate is doing and what Jesus are doing is they are having a conversation about an abstract reality. Truth is an abstract reality that is tied inseparably to the person. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The better question that Pilate should have asked is, who is the truth? He's standing right in front of you. Here he is, truth on trial. In mankind, another installment, another chapter in the human legacy of attempting to indict God, to indict truth, and to indict innocence, to justify self in sin. Impossible. Impossible. So when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him. And as I read through this, the story, we won't have time to finish this whole, this whole narrative, but as I read through the story all the way through 19 verse 16, you, did you hear that refrain? I mean, over and over and over again, Pilate keeps saying, I find no guilt. There's no charge of accusation. There's no label you can put on this guy. But ironically, he turns right around and says, but you have a custom that I release for you someone at Passover. Do you wish that I release for you the king of the Jews? And they said, not this man, but Barabbas. Ironic. Once again, John's irony is just so, just dripping off the page. If there's no charge of guilt, then why would you be offering up a mob to release him as a favor? You release him simply out of justice. But he's hoping that they would cry out, that they would, they would take that as a, as a ploy because he just doesn't want to uh, go ahead with this. Irony continues in verse 40 because Barabbas is an Aramaic name that means son of the father. Jesus is on trial for being, claiming to be the son of the father. And he is. And here's a man named son of the father who is not. And by the way, when, when Barabbas is labeled a robber, and you just think criminal, but don't think somebody who stole some gum at the grocery store. Think of an insurrectionist who had actually committed a coup against Rome. And so if ever there was a charge of somebody actually being a threat to Caesar, it would be Barabbas, not Christ. The irony could not be more thick. And Christ takes Barabbas' place. And then apparently it's tilted to try to dissuade them. Pilate takes Jesus out and scourges him. He puts together a crown of thorns, and you know what the thorns represent. It's a mockery of his, of his, of his authority. You know what the purple robe represents. It's a mockery of his uh, kingly, regal uh, claims. And then they greet him as king. They hail him as king in a mockery fashion. And literally, maybe even better in, in verse 3 would be they get, begin to give him blows. And so they bring him out and parade him in front of the, the Jews and they get all the more enraged and all the more bloodthirsty. This narrative is kind of disturbing, isn't it? It's hard not to go back and read even the familiar story of our Lord and Savior 
on trial at the hands of men. And it's hard for me not to see the purity of his innocence, the outstanding nature of his righteousness, and to just grit my teeth and say, this can't be. How dare he be treated this way? You see his silence? They bring all sorts of questions to him that have already been answered. They bring false accusations to him. He just remains silent. Although if they charge him by the living God, are you the son of man? He'll say, oh, sure, yep. And I'm going to come again with power. But other than that, he just remains silent. In the silence of this man, in the face of his mockers and his revilers and his oppressors and those who were mistreating him, just speaks a deafening silence as to his innocence. And he did all of this in our place. John the Baptist said it. Here's the Lamb of God uh, slain for the sins of the world. And John concludes his gospel in John chapter 20, verse 31. Um, sorry, 30 and 31. He says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may know and believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If Christ is not innocent, we have no life. If Christ is not innocent, we have no resurrection. If Christ is not innocent, we have no eternal life. If Christ is innocent, we have all of those things by faith in Christ. I mean, think about this, believer. If Christ was actually as innocent as this narrative portrays, and he was, and he actually satisfied his Father's wrath in the story of Good Friday, what wrath is left for you who are covered by his sufferings? If your sin was covered by his sacrifice, God the Father would be unjust to punish you for those sins. That's the significance of his innocence. That's what we celebrate on Good Friday, is the innocence of Christ. We're going to turn our attention to the Lord's Supper tonight. We're going to end our service by taking the Lord's Supper together to remember Christ's shed blood. Shed blood that was undeniably innocent. And it was shed and poured out on Friday, and he rose again on Sunday to give us newness of life. And so Christian, we're going to celebrate that. 